I have gotten 87 comments over the last 12 days, all asking the same thing. What happens when the last Bitcoin is mined? There are so many of them that one of them even spawned itself into our reality. I think it wants some answers too. So I did the research and the answer honestly made me feel a little uncomfortable. And the scariest part is that we're already 95% of the way there. A forgotten quantum computer in the Russian tundra is quietly humming away. Then it happens. A new Bitcoin block is solved. Block 6,300,000. But for the first time in history, the Coinbase reward field is empty. The only payment to that lone quantum computer is a handful of transactions. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry, I, I couldn't do that voice forever. But yeah, that's pretty much it. However, a lot of stuff that we don't know is gonna happen between now and then. And in order to understand how Bitcoin ends, you sort of have to understand what Satoshi was thinking about when it began. When Satoshi designed Bitcoin, the supply cap and the end of its life was one of the first things he came up with. He wrote, total circulation will be 21 million coins. It'll be distributed via network nodes when they make a block, and the amount will get cut in half every four years. But why 21 million? Satoshi never really gave a clear answer to that one. But some people think it's because at the time in 2009 when Bitcoin launched, the total money supply of the world was about 21 trillion USD. Or today, two NVIDIAs, three Apples, and one Tesla. But the real trick to figure out wasn't the math, it was the distribution. How do you fairly issue all 21 million coins without a central bank, a pre-sale, or trusting a alien looking, possibly hung, overpaid centralized developer to do it for you? You front load the distribution. Satoshi knew that Bitcoin was basically unusable in its early days. Barely anyone was running it. There were no exchanges, no price, no wallets. So incentivizing willing participants with transaction fees alone wouldn't cut it. There was no demand yet. Bitcoin blocks even went empty sometimes. Almost as empty as my childhood birthday parties. <laughs> guys, guys, I'm, I'm over it. <laughs> So that's where block rewards came in. An early incentive for Bitcoin security guards or miners to keep Bitcoin alive long enough for it to actually matter. In the first four years, over half of Bitcoin's total supply was mined and distributed via these rewards. And from there, those rewards got cut in half every four years. Each halving was essentially about tapering off the training wheels, like the ones from that bike that I never got on my eighth birthday. Oh, oh, guys, guys, I'm over it. Come on. Satoshi wasn't one to make many predictions about Bitcoin, but one of the ones he did make was, I'm sure that 20 years from now, there will either be very large transaction volume or none at all. It's been 17 years since he wrote that. Yet the weird part is somehow both things are happening at the same time. Bitcoin now settles trillions of dollars of transaction volume per year. More than PayPal, more than Western Union. That's the very large transaction volume part. But the no volume part, well, that's also true because today, Bitcoin's median transaction fee is lower in both dollars and Bitcoin than almost any other time in history. And miners have to settle for it. Paradoxically, while Bitcoin's market cap is soaring, demand for space in Bitcoin's permanent ledger is actually shrinking. In total, minor revenue from just transaction fees is only about 2%, less than the attendance rate of my eighth birthday party. What, what, what am I not supposed to share my childhood trauma with anyone? Come on. Yeah, I probably shouldn't do it on the internet though. Yet the reason that transaction demand is so low today is actually connected to a power struggle within the Bitcoin community when the transaction fees were too high. In 2015, Bitcoin fees were like $100, $200 per transaction, but developers couldn't come up with a good solution, so they split up into two different camps. On one side, you had the ones who wanted bigger blocks, i.e. more space and cheaper fees. The other said that that would sacrifice decentralization and that Satoshi's original block size was sort of key and part to the entire invention. Big blocks meant fewer players and nodes. Fewer nodes meant 
more trusting things like data centers, and having to trust data centers would probably just kill Bitcoin. After some infighting, the small block side won. Elegance in simplicity. I can't solve a Rubik's Cube, but you kind of get the metaphor here. So despite this limitation, the market adapted. Now we have the Lightning Network, a settlement layer on top of Bitcoin that can process over a million transactions per second, faster than Visa, MasterCard, PayPal, or any altcoin, and still pretty decentralized. But what Satoshi probably didn't predict was that the biggest fanatics about Bitcoin don't use it much at all. MicroStrategy and BlackRock now control over 7% of the total Bitcoin supply, up from about 0% just two years ago. And their Bitcoin doesn't move at all. It sits in custody, swapped between institutions maybe once or twice a year, all represented by shares and IOU notes on a different ledger. And it's the beginning of an issue that could collapse the Bitcoin security model before we even make it to 2140. If Bitcoin's transaction fee revenue doesn't change meaningfully soon, it essentially means that total miner revenue will just get cut in half approximately every four years. In order for miners to stay as profitable as they are in 2025, which is already a bit of a stretch, as they would in, say, 2070, one of two really crazy things has to happen. Either Bitcoin's purchasing power, or price in US dollars, has to double exactly every four years on average, or mining equipment efficiency also has to double in the same time frame. That's a treadmill that gets steeper every cycle. Some Bitcoin miners will adapt by using cheaper energy sources, things like hydro, flare gas, volcanoes, but that only buys them some time, maybe 40, 50 years at most. Developers like Peter Todd have proposed something called tail emissions, basically an update to Bitcoin's code so that when the final halving hits, a small subsidy would kick in that never quite hits zero. It would keep the miners paid, but technically breaks Bitcoin's 21 million supply cap, which is sacred scripture at this point. Other proposals keep the 21 million supply cap, but slowly recycle untouched coins back into the block reward after, say, 21 years, assuming that their owner either lost the keys or died. Except that's basically grave robbing. But maybe the problem isn't with the code, it's just with us. Block space is rare. There isn't enough for every human on Earth to even make one transaction per year. And yet, most investors don't even want that privilege. They just want to make more dollars from it. But that kind of misses the point, doesn't it? Bitcoin wasn't built to make you rich, it was built to make you free to give you control over your money in a way that no bank, broker, or government ever will. You know governments are collaborating with banks to automatically deduct speeding tickets out of your bank account? Speeding tickets are like a rite of passage, dude. I kind of question your testosterone levels if you've never got one before. And frankly, too many of you on YouTube or X are more excited about some corporation holding Bitcoin on your behalf than actually holding it yourself. Honestly, that's like buying a gym membership and asking Larry Fink to lift for you. Stop being a pussy and go pick up some steel. Oh, no, not this. Crypto steel. It's how you bring Bitcoin into the real world. You take that scary looking list of words, your seed phrase, and you turn it into something physical. Something fireproof, waterproof, ex-girlfriend proof, all while looking completely inconspicuous. I bet you didn't realize I had one on me the whole video. Get yours down below, 10% off with my coupon code EXIT. And if you're thinking, yeah, but what if I lose them or die? Two words, multi-sig. Multiple keys so your Bitcoin can outlive you. CASA builds this one. CASA is a full inheritance vault so that your family or Zoomer nephews can safely inherit your Bitcoin without being some sort of tech wizard, having to run a node, or even know what the heck a seed phrase even is. They've even put together this security guide so you can see if your Bitcoin setup will outlive you. They also told me not to film this in an actual graveyard, but it wasn't in the sponsorship contract. So uh, make sure to click the link before security comes on me. 2140 will not be the end of Bitcoin, but it will be the end of our excuses. When the final block reward is mined, there will be no more subsidy or training wheels left to pay for Bitcoin security. Only us. People who use the real Bitcoin will be the reason that it survives 30, 50, or 150 years into the future. Outsourcing that privilege out of convenience is going to be a generational fumble. So 
Go buy some real Bitcoin, hold your keys, run a node, and remember this. The last reward isn't Bitcoin, it's freedom.